Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. As summer draws to a close, rather than focus on the content we created in the past six weeks, we're looking at the wonderful series of interviews from the BBC's Wales cast uh, and what they mean for the past, present and future of Welsh politics. Joining me and Richard this evening to discuss her, and I quote, favourite Welsh podcast, that, that hurt a bit, Catherine, <laughs> is Catherine Glynn, who is the co-host of the Golai podcast from Cardiff University, also studying an LLM in Governance and Devolution at Cardiff University. Hello, Catherine. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I, you know, I, I don't know uh, who it hurt more, me or Rich, you know, your other co-host on the Golai podcast that you described Wales cast as your favourite Welsh politics podcast, but we'll move on. We, we, we don't hold grudges here. <laughs> he wasn't happy uh, about that. <laughs> Catherine, let's start us off with the first interview and your favourite bit of the Julie James interview. Yeah, well, firstly, these interviews were fantastic. I've said for a while that we need, um, like, the Welsh politicians have felt closer to the people anyway, and this, um, this series of interviews has just shown that, and it's been interesting to get to know members of the Welsh government, especially Julie James, who um, who maybe isn't as high profile as the others. And what I liked about her is that she, she, she was obviously against independence, but she didn't say that Wales couldn't do it. She said, I'm sure that Wales could be independent. I don't think that we're not capable of it. I just don't think that breaking the world into smaller and smaller nation states is a good idea. It's the, the idea of um, Wales being isolated. If we were independent, would we be within the EU or, or would we just be on our own, a small little country? Um, in the west of Europe so I think that was very interesting to hear from a Welsh government perspective as well uh, to see what she could bring up with that. Rich, uh, Britain is a little island on its own in the uh, west of Europe but what were your thoughts on that part of the interview? I thought it was really interesting and I think she really summed up the kind of two sides of Welsh Labour because she talked a lot about how Wales could of course change its relationship with the rest of the UK but also there's kind of reluctance to do so, obviously, because of the disruption that that would cause economically, socially, etc. But there was one little nugget that kind of caught my ear, which uh, echoed back to our previous podcast with James talking about how the Welsh independence movement is kind of tied up to the pro-European movement in Wales. She kind of in an offhand way said, you know, I, I bitterly regret coming out of Europe, bitterly regret it. Um, not just because of all the trade and all the rest of it, but just because of the identity of that. I feel European. I also feel British, to be fair, but I feel Welsh most, I suppose. Um, but I think that being part of an alliance of nations pulling together in the right direction is a really important thing to be. I don't think isolating yourself away on the corner of Europe is a good idea. So I think if you're talking about Welsh independence, most people accept that that would be part of a European Union, for example. If you gave me a choice between a Wales in, in the European Union or a Wales in the United Kingdom, I'm not really sure I know which one of those I'd choose. And she just kind of did an audible kind of shrug sound. And I thought that was really interesting because my interpretation of the kind of uh, uh, evidence that James was talking about a couple of pods back about where the support for Welsh independence is coming from kind of really summed that up as is that Wales could of course be independent but it would need to be in some kind of broader economic union with somebody because you know the world is is what it is and these kind of large economic blocks are everything and that kind of ambivalence about whether that's a you know a post Brexit you know Britain sized economic block or a pre-Brexit or post-post-Brexit European-sized block, I think, yeah, like an audible shrug. And I think that kind of sums up a lot of people's sentiments. How about you, Matt? What did you think? Uh, yeah, I think it was pretty close to the Welsh government line, though, wasn't it, really? It was harking back to some things that Drakeford said in the past, where, you know, if, if Scotland were to leave or Ireland were to reunify, of course, Wales would have to consider its position. But considering something, much like Julie's done here, doesn't mean you accept it or agree with it. Uh, and I think that's really what they're doing. I think there's this, there's this um, tendency in the Welsh government to hint at the possibility that if they don't get their own way, they may decide one day to turn around and say they want to up sticks and leave the UK. But I don't think they really believe that or mean it. Um, and I think they've just learned the lessons that people like Richard Wynne Jones have been talking about forever, which is you only get your own way if you kick up a bit of a fuss. And I think that's what essentially this boils down to, is, is the Welsh government trying to kick up a bit of a constitutional fuss. 
Any disagreement there? Audible shrugs. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so my personal fascination with that interview is the bit where Julie says, I think that is the better question, isn't it? Why would you want to be the first minister? Mark himself did not want to be the first minister. I have for a few weeks now since before this interview was coming out. And I don't know whether people have been briefed by about this, uh, that this interview was coming out or what, but for at least a good few weeks beforehand, people had been saying to me, the one person you really, really shouldn't rule out uh, as a potential candidate for first minister was Julie James. And then as soon as this interview came out, those voices didn't go away. And the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. The Welsh Labour Party, desperate for its first ever female leader. Julie James, a hugely experienced uh, cabinet member, campaigner, uh, well-liked within the group and within the wider party. And the more and more you think about it, the more and more it makes sense. Everyone's been talking about, including us, Vaughan Lynedd and Jeremy as the natural three candidates. Lynn and Morgan didn't get on the, nearly didn't get on the ballot, only because Carwin said, I'm going to lend you my vote. Did Lynn get on the ballot? Lynn got the support of Hugh Rankin Davis, Alan Davis. I don't think they'll support her this time. And she, I think she got the support of at least one other person who didn't end up backing her, but gave her a nomination so she could get on the ballot. That's not a good platform to be building on for the idea that you're going to get on the ballot again. Maybe Vaughan gets on the ballot again. Probably does, as the as the and I'm doing inverted commas here. The the candidate of the right of the Labour Party in Wales, which I don't think he is, but that's what how he's portrayed. And then Jeremy Miles, which everyone thinks is the obvious choice. But if you look at his constituency of voters in the group, you could argue that he's of the soft or centre left. Um, Julie James is of uh, more of a candidate of the left, even though again I think she's of the centre soft left Welsh tradition. So, and there's a good block of MSs in that group who would back the left candidate. And I think that if she wanted the nomination as the left candidate, I think you should start to really consider the possibility of that happening. So imagine where Mark Drakeford has just announced that he's standing down. How many members of the Senate from the Labour group does each candidate need? And who are the people that will choose Jamie, uh, Jamie, Julie, above the three front runners as widely accepted? I think it's five, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, I, I think it's that's done on maths rather than a set number, but I, th I think it's five. What was your second bit of the question? Uh, and who's going to nominate her? I appreciate this is putting you on the spot quite a lot in terms of, you know, prognostication. Mm. But Welsh Labour uh, leadership contests are not open to the same kind of uh, unexpected outcomes that they might be in Westminster or elsewhere. You know, we've not seen one that hasn't gone exactly the way that people predict. And I just don't think, as I see it, I don't think that Julie James has the support, the people who will support her above the candidates that are destined, are foretold to be the first minister. Um, and I, I just, I'm just kind of curious about who you think might go out there and support uh, Julie above, uh, say, Jeremy Miles. Well, I think, I think their constituency is very similar within the group. I think you're looking at people of the centre and soft left and the left. And I think you're looking at people from the Swansea Bay area around west. Uh, so I think that a lot of those, those people would quite happily back Jeremy, would quite happily back Julie. But there's enough of them within that constituent group, you're talking uh, the, the, the MS is on the left, you're talking your Jenny, uh, Jenny Rathbones, your, Julie, your, your Jane Hutz, etc. Your Mike Hedges is of the world. That if a genuinely left candidate came forward, I think there's, en there's enough people within that group to sustain both a candidacy from Julie and from Jeremy. Absolutely. So a Lynyrd misses out then in this scenario, does she? I don't think she necessarily has to miss out. But I mean, if you look at historically the case, she struggled to get the nominations in the last leadership election. I think that now maybe she's going to have a bit more time. You know, she'd only been an ass for like two and a bit years since the uh, in the last leadership election. So maybe people didn't think she'd served enough time. But I think you have to give it more consideration than I think people are otherwise doing. I think people think the cast the, the die is already set for the three candidates. And I don't think it's that simple. I, I can honestly easily see someone 
coming up from nowhere. And I don't think Julie James is coming from nowhere. She, she ran the campaign that produced the most successful electoral victory for Welsh Labour in its history of the Senate. She is being given the biggest portfolio of any minister with the most responsibilities of any minister. Shows a huge display of confidence in her and her ability to govern from Mark Drakeford. And everyone is gone. You've put uh, Vaughan in economy, you've put Jeremy in health, uh, in education, you've put Alina in health, positions they can thrive and prosper. And they've completely ignored the person with the biggest responsibility and the responsibility over what Mark Drakeford thinks is the single most important thing that he, his government is going to do in the next few years, the environment and climate change, but also huge amounts of responsibility over transport and housing, two things which Labour people are obsessed with. So if she can do a good job in that and win over people in that role, why can't she be First Minister? So, so Catherine, uh, does this sound to you like it does to me, like a wager in the making? <laughs> well, I think I actually didn't even, you know, I was one of the typical people who did think the next Labour leader would be the three that you've mentioned. But listening to her episode and her experiences and even things like her life experience, you know, she's been close to homelessness, she's been through a lot. You think people would be able to relate to her and, you know, she said that she's driven by anger and she's driven by the injustices in the world. And I think that kind of thing makes her seem closer to the people and like the fact that her portfolio now is so big and on the areas, issues that people care about and big issues. And if she does a good job, I really do think that it, it wouldn't be a surprise if she did um, become the next Labour leader, maybe the FM. Aha. You seem to be outvoted there, Richard. Yeah, you, you sounded somewhat lukewarm on the idea, but I will bet you... I don't know, a crate of very good Welsh craft beer um, that it will be Jeremy Miles. And um, if you want to take that wager, it's on the table. Well, I'm going to caveat, obviously, everything I've said by saying that I don't necessarily think that J Julie will win, but I definitely think she'll be a candidate. But in the spirit of fair competition, you know, live on this podcast, I will take your bet. I will take one of Pontypris' finest breweries against either Cardiff or Newport's finest breweries. Your choice. Fab. Brag de tut lol. There we are. Done. <laughs> right. That's a shout out and a sponsor read at the same time. No, it's not. Um, right. Let's move on then. So we've talked a bit about Julie and her leadership and constitutional positions or, or not. Um, there was just one thing that I wanted to um, add. Uh, it was, again, just a bit of a nugget uh, towards the end of the interview that I think Fliss asked about whether there was one thing that she could do and kind of put the words in her mouth that it might be Senate reform. Um, and the thing that caught my ear there was Judy's answer was... Swansea Councillor, 74, for goodness sake. I mean, it's just... It's nonsense. It's just too small. But how to do it, that's the thing. So we all agree it has to be done. How? Uh, up to this point, I think there's some, been some genuine questions up until this Senate term about whether everybody agrees it has to be done. But it does feel increasingly like that there is a determination uh, among Welsh government ministers, uh, as well as many in the Senate, if not um, you know all benches, for obvious reasons, Conservatives can't be seen to support, um, support Senate reform or expansion. But this vexed question about how it is going to be done I think is really interesting. And I was wondering, I don't know if either of you have any ideas about how Senate expansion could be done in a way that the Welsh Government could support it? I mean, to support it, it's one of those things I, I would not want to be deciding that, um, how to expand. Like, There's been a lot of talk over the past few years that you know there needs to be more members, but how they're going to do that with the, with the constituencies is going to be, I actually don't have a very good answer for this. I've it's not a job I would like to, to decide on how they're going to do it without making Labour, you know, getting them all on the side and without putting them at a disadvantage. I mean, the obvious way they do that is with the, what I have been trying to label super de hunt, uh, since about the day after the Senate election. No one seems to want to pick up my name uh, because they all think it's a terrible idea, including me. But um, I, I do think there's a very good chance that Labour try to use some sort of system where they basically keep De Hunt and its AMS system, but they just double the size of the, the list. So you end up with 80 MSs elected eight a region whilst keeping the 
40 constituency MSs. I, th I, I think that's probably how they'll get the compromise. Weirdly, I think that could end up being slightly more a system which is, is better for parties like the Lib Dems and the Greens than STV. Because if you had multi-member STV constituencies, I think the only way you do that is by allow it by letting more than one candidate of each party stand, which means you'd probably end up with lots of constituencies with two Labour, one Plaid two Tories, one all that kind of stuff. I think you'd actually then end up, you'd struggle to get candidates like the Greens or the, Lib well, maybe the Liberals, but you'd struggle to get them elected as, as easily, I think. Whereas if you have systems like De Hunt, because of the, the division effect, I think you'd end up getting at least a couple of Greens elected using a, a longer list system. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, I think it's really, it is really tricky. I, I to me, I don't think that the I, whilst I think there's a, a good sound basis of logic um, to what you're suggesting there, Matt, um, I think that 80 is probably undercooking the expansion that's needed. Um, my sort of pet theory is similar in that I don't think that we're going to get STV. Um, I don't think that's going to happen because it, it's it's more complicated now that the Westminster uh, constituencies are being redrawn, which means that we are going to have this break for the first time, no matter what happens. If the Senate stands still, we're going to have this break between Westminster and Senate constituencies. Um, and I would have thought that they'll want to reduce the administration overhead of whatever expansion that they do um, so that it's you know, not a huge time consuming piece of work because there's so many other priorities in this coming Senate. My gut instinct would be that they would keep more or less everything as it is, but maybe go for multi member constituencies by first past the post, which doesn't really uh, address the um, <laughs> doesn't really address the proportionality or the representation, but it does uh, address the numbers and it gives you a nice round number. If you make every constitu constituency a two seat constituency, it gives you 100 Senedwyr uh, sen uh, uh, members of the Senedd. Um, it. Say yeah. it. It's the right name for them. It, it does make more sense. But uh, to me, that's what I, if, if they could find a rule, you know, a, a mechanism to make that work so that they don't have to change the regional map, they don't have to can change the constituency map, but they just kind of either affect the number of first past the post uh, constituency seats or the regional lists, they expand the regional list. I think that's considerably more likely than a, f a full scale boundary review and or a change of voting system, uh, unfortunately, but I think that's the way it is. One thing I would say on that is remember that in order to get this through, they need two thirds. And as the Conservatives are determined not to vote through any more MSs this term, you would need support of Plaid Cymru in order to get this through. And I don't think you get this through the Senedd without an element of proportionality. Mm. I, I, interesting thing is, depending on how they w do it, of course, and, and this is all hypothetical, you can kind of crunch, you can only look back at the previous election data to kind of get a feel for how it might come out. I've had a couple of runs at trying to crunch the data, and if they were able to find a way to make it work, that the kind of proportion proportional results that would be returned by um, dual uh, dual constituency candidates um, is sort of similar uh, to what we saw now, just obviously larger numbers. Um, and I wonder if that itself might be enough. But what it, but what an expanded Senate does, it means that there's much less likelihood that you get one party big enough to govern on its own, and it increases the likelihood of coalitions or agreements of some kind. And I, I wonder ultimately if that's enough. And you know, we, we saw that there was grudging acceptance to separate off the votes at 16 element um, in the previous round of Senate reform. And I just think, you know, at the end of the day, expansion is more important than... Let me roll that back. I think I expansion is more politically expedient than addressing the, the problem of representation, um, alas. Uh, you just said no one's able to form a majority government. You've just lost 10 Labour backbenchers. <laughs> Catherine, what were you going to say? So the, the expansion, I think, the fact that she's she's mentioned that and it's very clearly on board. It's just such a such a sign that you know that's that's where it is heading, and it's been seriously discussed now. Because you know, if and to those of us who maybe want more devolution, they really couldn't have more as it is now. Because you know their workload is, you know, she mentioned herself, the workload is is 
massive. So they, for if, if, if a big area like justice was devolved, then you would need at least 100 members to be able to cope with the workload of that. And yeah, it's quite, it's quite positive that she mentioned that, actually. Shall we move on from Julie, as interesting as her interview was? Katrin, let's move on to Kirsty. What was the bit of Kirsty's interview you liked? Um, I enjoyed, well, towards the end, actually, where she was speaking about the security issues that she has been subject to, especially around the death threats that she's been getting. Living in a community that you represent and the inability, or my inability, maybe other people do it better, but my inability to keep my family safe from that that is much worse, actually, and is much more upsetting than the death threats because the police deal with them really quickly and efficiently. So it, it's the girls seeing that sort of stuff said about you, oh, is it? That, that I had was... to come home. I had to come home and explain to my daughters what the word concubine meant. Mum, that man on the television said that you were a concubine. Everybody on the news is talking about it, Mum. What, what is that word? You shouldn't have to come home from work and have to think about that kind of thing. And um, it, it, it's it very much like struck a chord with me. And like something needs to be done about the way that women, especially, are treated. That's from me, what I see on my social media is a lot of the abuse when I do see it is directed towards women. And um, when they defend themselves, they're seen as you know, raging feminists. But then, you know, you can't just let it happen because, as she said, it's getting worse and it's not any way to encourage women to get into politics. So, yeah, that was a bit worrying to hear that. Obviously, having left now left the Senate, Kirsty's in a position to speak more openly about a lot of those issues. But yes, I, th I don't think there's anyone who would have listened to that who didn't feel quite surprised, you know, that that, that level of uh, antipathy and kind of antagonism and abuse was happening to a, a, a Welsh mem a member of the Welsh Parliament, as opposed to, you know, we hear about it a lot with regards to members of the Westminster Parliament. Sometimes, uh, and I think I can probably be as guilty of this as many other people, I, you know, I think about Wales as being, you know, generally quite a peaceful, consensual, you know, kind of, uh, you know, quite well mannered kind of part of the UK. You know, I look at the community that I live in and you, know, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect people um, to kind of be sharing that kind of abuse. Um, uh, but then, you know, it, it's quite, it, it's very welcome to hear firsthand from someone like Kirsty, someone who I think is one of those politicians that has left the Senedd um, with uh, uh, her integrity, both professional and personal integrity, enhanced by the experience of being there. Um, I think it's a rare case of that uh, of breaking that truism that all political careers end in failure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously on, from a party perspective, the Liberal Democrats aren't in a, in a great place, but the career of Kirsty Williams, I think, is one that has been widely praised as being very successful. Um, so even somebody of, you know, of that standing to have suffered that kind of abuse, yeah, I mean, it was pretty awful. And uh, it kind of shatters an illusion that maybe a lot of people have that Wales is quite a civilised kind of political culture really i mean it harks back to a lot of what we when we talked to uh, beth and syed about her leaving the immediate political arena she didn't th seem to think that wales and welsh politics was particularly well set up for well for young families but for young women especially and she did it she she hinted at the level of trolling and abuse you can get and that's the case and i think social media has you know, for all its many, many benefits, bringing people like us together, and, and I'm sure lots of our listeners too, it has opened up this Pandora's box of misery, spite and hate that we just can't control. And I think especially in politics and political discourse, we have a tendency to um, be a bit two-footed in our tackles because we can't see the person. We say things that we would never say in person to people. And there is a, there's a fascinating line here, I think, which is fair challenge. You should, as a politician, I don't think you should be able to run away from fair challenge, but I think there has to be a level. And I think there has to be a, a level of appropriateness there. And there has to be the right forum for it. I, I don't think you should be allowed to endlessly troll your elected representatives on, on Twitter 
or Facebook. Sadly, one of the ways our democracy works is they don't have to respond to you anyway. Even if you email them, they don't have to respond to you. They are, they're only held to account once uh, every five years, and that's at the ballot box. And that's the way we've signed up, right? I think that us all as a society has a lot of questions to ask itself. And hearing it from someone like Kirsty, someone who has been at the top of the game for so long, must have such a thick skin having done it for as long as she has. And to see how it affects her and how it affects her family was 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 absolutely gutting for me and i cannot begin to imagine how it felt for for for, for all women but especially young women who want to enter the political uh, arena because it, it it must put everything into such sharp focus yeah it's a shame because you think it is only the minority who who do that most people most people in the world you know are respectful but it's it, it will it will put many people off like that's if i was ever considering going into politics that would definitely put me off the abuse of feeling safe and whether those people making the threats online would then move um, to, you know, carry out those threats in person. You, you never know, do you, what, with what people are going to do these days. Yeah, and, and you know, just to pick up on another thread that uh, is unrelated to, to that, uh, fortunately, but um, just things that might put people off politics is the, t the terrible feeling of losing. Um, and I think that the section where Kirsty talked about the 2016 uh, Senate election where the Lib Dems were almost completely wiped out. I think that was an it was another really um, impactful section of the uh, uh, of the interview where she talked about the idea, you know, that the idea that she felt guilty for not going down with the ship. Yes, it was the 2016 campaign was just horrific because, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you, you could read the runes and you kind of knew where you were going uh, and where things were going and you know uh, and what should have been a night of great celebration in here in Brecon and Radnorshire with as I said a majority of over 8,000 <laughs> something that you know no Liberal Democrat could ever you know yes they were voting for you mm. rather than the party weren't but, they um I, you'd have to ask people but it was it, but it was a devastating night and you know as much as I loved representing Brecon and Radnor, there was a part of me that that night wished I'd gone down with the ship. And that feeling of, you know, it was quite extraordinary to think about someone, he's the leader of this party in Wales, kind of genuinely saying that she almost wishes that she'd lost um, because of that sense of camaraderie. And I think that that is another thing that can really put people off standing in politics is that you know almost particularly in certain parts of wales standing as a candidate for a party that isn't the one with the huge first past the post uh, you know uh, um uh, track record of winning in a constituency is absolutely awful and that idea that you would go out there knowing that you're going to be defeated um i think it's also a testament to the fact that kirsty herself managed to survive that kind of bonfire of the liberal um, representation in Wales based on the quality of her own personality. So it's almost like the other side of the coin that we were just talking about where people get abuse for you know, doing their job, and in Kirsty's case, doing it quite well. But in her area, in Brecon and Radnor, she was rewarded, um, even if that, uh, by her constituents, by electing her with an enhanced majority in, I think, in 2016. But actually, the kind of hollowness that she felt about being the only one that won must have been incredibly difficult. And you really felt that came across very strongly in the, in the pod. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? The whole Kirsty's electoral success thing uh, and the Liberals, because and this sort of touches, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of mix this up with what I was going to talk about as well, if that's OK. She had a majority of around 8,000 in 2016. And then when she left, the, the Conservatives ended up with a majority of nearly the same the other way. It is an absolute testament to how loved and respected she was in Brecon and Ravner that she kept that seat going when every other time it was it was falling away from her. I mean, they didn't when she won in 2016, they didn't hold that seat at a part of UK parliamentary level, even though Jane Dodds took it back for about three months in in uh, 2019. Faye Jones took it straight back in the December election. With a with a quite significant majority, so it is it's 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 conservative territory, and for her to do so well in 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 holding it off was a fantastic achievement for her, absolutely fantastic achievement. And they have experienced quite a difficult period electorally, um, 
especially since they went into coalition. And the bit of the interview with Christy that I really wanted to focus on was, was coalitions, the way she talks about various coalitions. So in the episode, she talks about her, what can only be described as horror at the UK government conservative liberal coalition. People who vote for a political party expect you in a way to behave in a certain way. And I think one of the issues that we've had to contend with as a political party was that the people that voted for us in that general election, the vast majority of them probably never anticipated that we would end up supporting a conservative government. And that and that that, that kind of fracturing really, I think, you know, where the party is still living with the consequences. She also talks about the 2007 potential rainbow coalition. A Liberal Democrat group uh, putting conservative and nationalist forces into power uh, in that country and, and supporting that. And, you know, I think what's it, I just, could, I just couldn't do it. I just, I just could not do it. But I don't think the reaction to the rainbow coalition had the Liberal Democrats done that been as damaging to the Liberal Democrat brand in Wales as the 2010 coalition government at the UK level. And I think it's the UK Liberal Party that has done a lot of the work to damn the Welsh Liberal Democratic Party. I mean, I think that's interesting. Um, they always say with the coalition, the, the minority party always comes off worse in the next election. I mean, it shows clearly that it impacted... Uh, the party in Wales but I think if yeah I think if the Rainbow Coalition happened then the Liberal Democrats wouldn't have looked too bad like it would have looked awful on Plaid Cymru I think Leanne would touch on that in her in her interview it looked it would have looked awful on them but you know you could tell by her that she 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 really didn't like that that happened um but respected Nick Clegg for for doing what he did Rich, you can tell that I think I want to hone in on the specifics of Kirsty's answer to this. She couldn't countenance putting conservative and nationalist ministers into government. So even though she ended up working in government with David Ellis Thomas, who would have been in government probably had Plaid Cymru, well, he was dead presiding officer, but he may well have ended up in the governing party. Even though she ended up working with him in government, government, she couldn't countenance the idea of voting in nationalist and conservative ministers to government. What do you think that says about Kirsty's politics? Well, I would observe, and I always feel this, I find this absolutely fascinating, uh, that it is a, a good representation about quite how complicated the Liberal Democrat position on almost everything is. Um, because you, you have a party in the Lib Dems, you know, talking about the the UK government coalition, um, you know, nominally a federal party, so each of the component elements should have an equal say, but she didn't seem to suggest that she'd had an awful lot of say in the decision um, as the leader of the Welsh party. Also the party that is, you know, very unashamedly convinced that PR is the best idea. Um, but not apparently huge uh, fan of coalitions or coalition partners, um, uh, which is an interesting quandary because it does somewhat limit um, the people that you're willing to go into coalition with. If you're not willing in the Welsh context to do uh, to do any kind of governing, governing uh, agreement with either the Conservatives or Plaid Cymru, it does basically mean that you'll work with Labour and the Greens and no one else, which is an interesting position. Um, uh, and, and I think it does ultimately reveal that while, uh, you know, we've talked a lot, everyone talks a lot about the idea that that rainbow coalition is a sliding doors moment. Uh, I don't think we've learned anything since or out of these interviews that suggests that one, it was ever really going to happen or two, that if it had happened, that it would have been particularly successful, because it seems that pretty much everybody, apart from a few members of Plaid Cymru and a few members of uh, the Welsh Conservatives, uh, thought that they could make it work. And, uh, you know, we'll perhaps use this opportunity, if you're happy to do so, to start talking about Leanne, talking about the same issue. Um, and, you know, she could not have been clearer. Uh, and I suspect there was a small number of other Plaid Cymru members at the time who felt the same way. 
a programme where you're going to govern jointly. People here would never have forgiven Plaid Cymru if we'd have done that. That's the core question here, you know, it's a question of trust, integrity and consistency. And I understand, <laughs> I firmly believe anyway, that, that if Plaid Cymru does something like that and, and collaborates with what essentially most people see as the class enemy, then we'd never be forgiven. We'd never be forgiven. It would be the last election that we did well in. I think we can safely assume now that the Rainbow Coalition was never really uh, a prospect, um, no matter how close it apparently became. Um, and if it had happened, uh, that I think we can probably guess that it would have been a bit of a disaster um, for all involved. It may have been a plague on all of their houses. The documents in the National Library of Wales will disagree with you forever, Mr. Martin. But yeah, you know, you, you, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. I think even even if they came to an agreement, I don't know how much they would have got done. Would it have been enough for them just to keep Labour out of power? I think if that would have been the case, Labour would have come back and stonked it in the next election. Um, because there's no way you could justify uh, a government programme of Liberals, Nationalists and Conservatives to an audience of Liberals, Nationalists and Conservatives and keep them all happy. I don't think. And, and just to pick up on a, the nugget that um, Leanne kind of followed up with uh, that section with, and I thought it was quite, it was a, it was a great bit of interviewing. As you know, we'll we'll give full uh, credit to um, uh, James Fliss and uh, Dan uh, at the end, no doubt. But um, it was a great short question um, about the SNP, and Leanne was really interesting in her answer. But in Scotland, you know, the SNP... They would never touch the Tories with a barge board. Well, they put it in the constitution. Well, they but can't. when they were in minority <laughs> government, you know, there were a lot of votes where it was Tory votes that, oh, that budget got deals. through That's at the a, end of the budget day. Budget deals are a completely different thing. And, you know, votes on individual issues, fine. Even if that's First Minister, right? You know, Leanne has a, a fearsome reputation for being uncompromising. Um, but actually, in that answer, I think it showed that her period as leader did make her a bit of a practical leader and there was a bit of real politic there because you do need to sometimes vary from what would be the obvious choice on your principles uh, in order to get things done uh, particularly if you're in a difficult thing and you know that uh, first minister vote back in 2016 continues to be possibly the most dramatic moment that the Shambhara has seen thus far I think that she by the sounds of it she's unrepentant uh, about that and you know no doubt future conversations will be had with her on on various media about exactly how that came about. Catherine, you wanted to talk a little bit about Leanne's leadership strategy, didn't you? Yeah, it was it was interesting to hear just how how candidly she spoke, I guess. You know, she she's free to do that now. And it was just interesting to hear how she just totally disagreed with how when Adam became leader that he just changed the whole strategy that she'd been she'd clearly was passionate about and believed in. And that it had all gone, and you kind of do see that reflected in how the party is now. With you know the, the last election, they didn't do too well in, especially you know losing her seat was a big shock, and just the impatience with how you know people, especially you do see people in the independence movement who do want things to happen now, but nothing is you know we've got a very long way to go before before even considering that. And I think that the way the strategy has now gone and Adam's promise of an independence referendum within five years was put people off and has, you know, taken the party backwards and they've got a lot of steps left to climb. My favourite bit of the of that whole episode, and it's maybe not favourite's the wrong word, but the bit that made me, like, stand up the most was just the way she delivered the line. We're not friends now. We haven't been friends for years. Actually, I think that... James and Felicity were a bit shocked and taken aback by it. It's not what you expect a politician to say, because he's honest, no offence to politicians. It's just so cuttingly honest. And most people, even if you know they don't get on, they say, no, we have a fine professional working relationship or something like that. They never say we're not friends now. But I suppose she doesn't have to anymore. But I found that bit, that whole section so interesting. And I agree with Catherine, you know, from independence to Brexit, it sort of shows that Leanne doesn't trust Adam's political judgment. And, you know, given the Senate results, I think a lot of people agree. She thinks he got it wrong. And I think a lot of people would say he got it wrong. I think that 
we're not friends now. We haven't been friends for years. It's, yeah, again, fascinating from a personal perspective because we don't get enough of the personal in politics, I don't think, even though me and Catherine have, have moaned about trying to keep it separate. I think there's a huge importance to understanding why people react and interact the way they do, and so much of that is, is personal. But it's a display of trust. And whilst even Leanne says she thinks it's perfectly fine for in Plaid Cymru, your leader to be challenged, I think that's a terrible rule. Just putting that out there. Not Plaid Cymru member thinks it's a terrible rule. And having spoken to lots of people in the Labour Party, you know, the people that Adam was trying to win over, they don't feel like they can trust Adam Price. They feel that Plaid is a bit rudderless and a bit valueless in a way that they didn't feel when Leanne was leader and I think that this spits across Plaid and across a lot of the independence movement now is this values based judgment of what Wales should be versus the idea of just being an independent nation per se and I think that even though if it's not meant to be that way you can see so much in this bit of the interview with Leanne so many of the problems that face Plaid Cymru is this they 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 are maybe they are a bit impatient maybe they don't quite know what they want or how to get there and I think that in that section, Leanne sums up so much of the problems that, well, I think Welsh politics has in general, but especially Plaid Cymru have, uh, in a very, very astute but quite personal way as well. Well, we've saved the most exciting to last. What did we learn from Secretary of State for Wales, Simon Hart? There's some form of rare bird from Costa Rica that's green, and he is not much one for discussions about the Constitution. Uh, do, do elaborate on that, Matt. <laughs> well, no, I, I think me and Katrin probably picked the same bit from this. Katrin? No, my, um, my dissertation is actually on the effect of the Internal Market Act on, on the territorial constitution. So, you know, I was very alert when he, when he briefly mentioned, uh, mentioned this. UK Internal Markets uh, thing, not the most exciting of uh, topics in anybody's house has hardly been talked about on the beach in Pendine today, I suspect, um, is doesn't remove any uh, of Welsh Government's current influence, nor does it intend to. I wasn't surprised to, to hear that he didn't think that the UK Government and their act um, impacted uh, devolution and the Welsh Government's powers. Um, indirectly, it definitely does. The, the market access principles put a restriction on what the Welsh Government can do. And even though they can say we ban single-use plastics, they can't stop um, single-use plastics coming in from other parts of the UK. So, I mean, he, he wasn't technically incorrect, but it definitely does. You know, it's a protected enactment along with the Withdrawal Act. So it, it was very, like, very black and white the way he explained um, or tried to explain that and made me want to have a little word <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, little no, word? Yeah. What is that little word, Catherine? <laughs> little word is maybe to to study governance and devolution at Cardiff University. <laughs> yeah, Fine plug there. Fine plug. That's, that. that's a sponsored read as well, everybody. Um, Rich, what did you think of it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the same bit that I had. The, the thing that the Johnson administration in, in London has fine form when it comes to um, asserting something that isn't true uh, over and over again until people believe that it's true. And that being essentially, you know, uh, a, a considerable um, part of their communication strategy since 2019. UK internal markets uh, thing not, doesn't remove any uh, of Welsh government's current influence, nor does it intend to. Um, and neither of those two statements are true. Um, it does, it did change the powers. It amended the schedule to the uh, to the Wales Act 2017, added new things in there, state aid being the, the key one. So it did fundamentally change the powers. But more importantly, it's it did also very much intend to put Wales back in its box. And it basically made the Welsh Government and the Scottish Government and the Northern Ireland, no, not the Northern Ireland Government, the Welsh government and the Scottish government, essentially like one of those Chinese nail houses. You've probably seen the photos of these on your timeline on social media where the Chinese government has decided it puts a, it wants to put a motorway through a stretch of land, but there's one person in their house who really wants to hold on to their house. So the Chinese government just builds 
the motorway around their house or whatever. So you end up in the position where the Chinese government hasn't changed your house. You still have, you know, four bedrooms and a porch and everything. You just have to cross a four lane highway to get there. And that's more or less what the, well, uh, the UK government is doing with the Welsh government with what the Internal Market Act is that, yeah, you can still have these powers. They just don't mean anything anymore. Um, and, and it's the brazen clarity you know, the intellectual clarity with which he says, oh, yes, this is, oh, of course we didn't. Of course we didn't mean to do anything. I just find that really grating. Um, you know, I, there is a perfectly reasonable position, which he talks about later in the pod, which is that, you know, if your belief is that the UK government should have the power to do pretty much anything it wants to anywhere in the UK, then that's a perfectly reasonable position to say, well, this is what I believe and this is what my government feels that it can do and we're going to do it. But to do it and then claim that you're not doing it is is really it's Johnsonian. I think that's probably the, the only um, uh, way that we can describe it these days. Um, and I, I found that really grating uh, in the way that he did that. And also, similarly, I mean, this is exactly the same problem that I have with the conservative uh, arguments against Senate reform, which are, you know, ac these are academic um, constitutional matters. No one talks about constitutional matters on the door, so we shouldn't do anything about the constitution. That would be fine if in the UK Parliament you are not constantly enacting constitutional law. You know, you know these aren't things that come up on the door, the, but they are an essential part of the machinery of government. You know, and it's just it's just such a weak straw man argument to say ah oh, constitutional stuff no one ever talks about it but it actually means something and what i find really challenging about the logic of their position it was when he was talking about the um the m4 and that the union review and of course the uk government these are uk infrastructure projects that uh you know if the uk government decides they're uk projects then they should be able to make them which you know rather like hs2 for which wales is paying and not getting any benefits whatsoever what that sees past, and maybe it is that your, if your vision of the UK as a unitary country, not a state, but a unitary country, which is what, um, when he was talking about the kind of emotional engagement, what is Britain, what is the UK, if your your mental model of the UK is a unitary country, then maybe whoever wins in the centre can do whatever they like. Maybe that's right. But what I'm always reminded of is that particularly after the last general election for the UK Parliament, you have seen this thing where the same pattern we've seen for a long time now, where there is no democratic support for the UK government's programme for government in Wales or in Scotland or in Northern Ireland. So how can you possibly argue that you have the democratic mandate to do these things in those territories if those territories have not supported you. And that, I think, is ultimately going to be the Conservatives' undoing um, in Wales. It will continue to be their undoing in Wales. It will continue to be their undoing in Scotland because at the centre there is a failure to envisage what life is like outside of England, where the, the hinterland for the Conservative Party is. And I think it, it's almost like a blind spot for them. Um, and, I, you know, like I say, I... I think it's a perfectly defendable position if, the, if that's what you believe, but you have to be open and honest that that's what you believe. Um, and you have to make that part of your election pitch, basically. And you and you have to do what they are doing, which is to put the, the structures in place to be able to overrule um, the devolved nations completely. Um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting quandary um, for, the, uh, for the UK government, I think. Well, I mean, he says that constitutional conventions are claptrap. Fantastic word, terrible opinion. But again, it just boils me down to these questions of why parties like Welsh Labour and the Liberal Democrats think that the UK is reformable, if that is the attitude that people have to it from the centre. And I know that despite the fact that Keir Starmer talks about him wanting to do a constitutional convention, there are people in the Labour ranks who agree with Simon Hart. The stuff like this is claptrap. Well, I just want to say there are people in this podcast ranks who uh, also think that constitutional conventions are claptrap because they are, and we know they are, because they're the inverse of the uh, Conservative Party position. The, the Conservative Party position is we don't want any of that because we don't want to see any change. 
the the Labour Party side of that is we'd quite like to see some change, but we don't want to say anything about it or kind of lead the front because we're scared about what certain parts of our own party will say about it. So we want to have a constitutional convention. You know, it is he's right about that, but you're also right about the broader picture, of course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you call everything an inquiry or a commission or a convention if you don't want to see the results of 15 years, right? And I'm sure that's the case. It's the, it's the thing you can turn around to and go, don't worry, I don't, uh, we're, we're having a convention. Oh, I, I, I can't possibly answer that question. I don't want to uh, prejudge the outcome of the convention. It's inevitable what the uh, answer will be if there ever is a convention, which is, uh, we'll tell you in 15 years. I, I, just, I just don't know why Labour people walk around now saying reform is inevitable when I don't think that's true at all. Catherine? Uh, yeah, on the, the it's the union salvage, but it, it's a very interesting point that the Simon Hartz and then Mark Drakeford's vision or um, what they're hoping that the, the union the union could be is just totally different wavelengths. And then it makes you think all four of the governments or the Northern Ireland executive they all want different things for the union, and that is that's a problem that's not going to go away, especially with a centre and a UK government that really believes that the UK is a unitary state and without doing anything to you know, to, to involve the government, the other governments in, then nothing is going to change. And then it goes back in a circle. How are you going to get all the four governments to agree on anything or in the same room discussing um, the future of the union where it's clear that they're not going to agree on that, especially with Scotland halfway, their foot is halfway out already, isn't it? <laughs> Wanting to kind of uh, give uh, fair credit to um, the Secretary of State for some of the things that he said that were, if not massively interesting, but I think they were to his credit. I mean, I think one of the things that when he was talking about the Brexit vote, I think you could s sense the genuine uh, conviction with which he was saying that despite whatever you thought when you had a democratic ma uh, uh, event like that, that there was an obligation to pursue the result, uh, instead of getting um, sidetracked into all manner of uh, various ways of trying to uh, stop it. Now, I'm not going to say that that that's just simply rubber stamping a, a, a vote and rubber stamping any of the Theresa May or um, Boris Johnson proposals for how to go about Brexit would necessarily be uh, would necessarily be doing anybody a, 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 um, any benefit. But I think that the idea that the conversation after the 2016 referendum should have been, how do we do this? And I, when Simon Hart was appointed um, in place of Alan Cairns, I think there was a lot of hopes that his slightly more uh, emollient doesn't, it doesn't sound like a nice thing to say a, 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 a about someone, but- um, I don't know what that word means. Um, emollient would be sort of oily and supple. Uh, in a way that it, your skin might be, I don't know. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm regretting glad it. I don't know what the word means. I'm regretting it completely now. But his slightly more um, moderate position compared to Alan Cairns's more aggressive position as Secretary of State was, I think, widely perceived as being a good thing. And you do wonder if, you know, if under the Cameron administration, whether actually Simon Hart would have actually been quite a good Conservative Secretary of Wales on that. Uh, in that context, because he he doesn't have the kind of axe grinding agenda um, that perhaps some of his predecessors have had, such as uh, David Jones and Alan Cairns. Um, and the other thing that I thought that it was just an interesting observation, um, and I think that there is a degree of truth to it. First Minister's possibly being, and actually funny enough, one of his colleagues told me this other day, rather mischievously, um, that... Uh, he 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 tends to see everything through a sort of you know ply cymru threat i remember when we were talking about the election i think we discussed here and i suggested that the labor party feeling threatened by ply cymru is not necessarily a reflection of the reality on the ground in most constituencies it isn't sure in some constituencies but for the most part it isn't the case but if you think about um where mark drakeford's policy platform comes from you could see that it the kind of voters that um mark drakeford 
wants to keep on board are the ones that might drift to Plaid Cymru rather than the ones that might be tempted to vote for the Conservatives, possibly because there's more of them. But but I think that that is a, a fair analysis. And I, I don't think you can look at what the First Minister is doing in Wales and think that he feels particularly threatened by the Conservatives. You know, maybe he doesn't feel at the moment, he probably doesn't feel particularly threatened by Plaid Cymru. But m- if he'd been up against the early Leanne Wood Ply Cymru, maybe he would have felt a bit more threatened by that. And that's that's probably fair. That's probably fair on behalf of the Secretary of State, I think. The the only Ply Cymru that Mark Drakeford is afraid of is the one from 1999. Uh, and it shows in the way he altered his, po- well, maybe his politics, maybe not particularly, but has managed to, in the 22 years or so in which he's been involved in Welsh politics, transform the Welsh Labour Party into this body that embraces its Welshness in a way that, in a civic and political way, in, in a way that which cut off completely Plaid Cymru's chances of ever growing past their 1999 peak. So if Simon Hart says that Mark Drakeford is acting in a way to lose voters, uh, to, to prevent losing voters to Plaid Cymru, Simon Hart says he wasn't particularly involved in, po- in electoral politics before 2007 or so. He needs to look at the 1999 election, because that is what has influenced Mark Drakeford's politics in a way that stops him losing votes to Plaid Cymru. And I don't think he's reacting in any way, shape or form now to the material circumstances in which he faces that's making him worried about losing voters to Plaid Cymru. I think it comes from a genuine place where he thinks that Wales is being ridden roughshod over by the UK government. I don't think he is scared particularly of Plaid Cymru. And the last election showing, why on earth should he be? With that in mind, and with us having... um done the tour of the four really, really good podcasts from Wales, the Walescast team over the summer. I, I just wonder if it's worth a little bit reflecting on the state of, you know, what the, the contribution that Walescast has made uh, over the time that it's been running. I mean, here we are on a podcast with a guest podcast host talking about another Welsh podcast, which is pretty unthinkable, um, uh, uh, you know, if where we were just a year and a half ago, that we would have that kind of uh, circularity in the, in the Welsh new media space. Um, but I think that Walescast has really come of age over the summer. I think uh, there have been trials by um, the BBC to do a number of uh, podcasts over over the years. There was the Welsh language series, Sean Ball or Brexit, um, uh, and its successors, which sort of kind of was there for a while and then drifted away. And similarly, there was a Podledi Ad Cymru View the, uh, during the election period, which again was very good, but seems to have drifted away now. And I think that there was perhaps a, a fear that uh, the Wales cast, um, the decision to do the Wales cast was perhaps going to be time limited or under review. And there's a possibility that it might wane in the post-election period. Um, but actually, I think full credit to the production team. They've, they've really pulled it out of the bag over the summer with a series of long form interviews. Now, Helped, I think, largely by um, front-loading the Julie James revelations about Aphex Twin and various other things, which I think did capture the public imagination in a way that we uh, wouldn't normally expect to be um, so by um, uh, our politicians. But I I just thought it was a real kind of benchmark. They've laid down uh, a benchmark about how good Walescast can be and also long-form political interviews, getting, you know, more than a few few minutes on a uh, uh, Sunday supplement programme or... Guinea or whatever, you know, it's just really good to see that. And we actually learn more, to, to echo Catherine's point from earlier, we actually learn more about the people that are making decisions uh, about our day-to-day lives. And I, I just thought that was a, a real success. Um, any any thoughts, folks? Well, Catherine, you said that it was your favourite Welsh podcast. So what did you think? What do you think it adds to the to Welsh media landscape? I just think it's it's crucial. I really do. I think it it's good for people like us who who have an interest in in Welsh politics and what goes on in Wales and the fact that it's it's released weekly is 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 just fantastic. It means you don't have to go you know searching the web to to find um, you know the updates that that everybody should be getting. And I I also think like for a few of my family members, it's helped them you know understand Welsh politics more, which is so important and has become more of an issue or more of been more acknowledged devolution since the pandemic has happened and I think these interviews over the summer um, have just made as people understand maybe why some decisions have been made and the fact that they are so long but most of them have been really interesting and you know kept you wanting more almost 
is, is a kind of a mix between the way that Felicity and James are and, you know, the, the kind of lighthearted banter that they can bring, but also the questions, that they do ask the hard questions, they, you know, they're not afraid to, and I think that the scoops that they get are, are fab, and I hope they keep making them. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that these long-form interviews have been exemplary and genuinely news-setting. Incredible congratulations goes out to the, to the whole team that, that set them up. But I also think that when we're back in the swing of things, Wales Cast has a really important role in educating the wider public in a very manageable and consumable way about what's going on in the Senate and in Westminster with the Welsh angle, I think, for the benefit of Wales and for our polity, I think we all wish them a long and successful run. With that said, uh, we would like to thank Katrin for joining us this evening. Um, Thank you very much, Katrin. If people want to hear more from you, where can they find you on Twitter? Katrin underscore Glynn. Thank you very much. Mr. Martin, where can the people find you? At Mimosa Cymru. Uh, and uh, don't forget to listen. You can listen to more of Katrin and occasionally myself uh, on the very intermittent Cardiff University politics podcast, Golay. And I am at Hexter101, H-E-X-T-E-R 101. If you have enjoyed what you've listened to tonight, please do not forget to find us on Medium at Here I Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here I Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here I Blog. Thank you for listening to Here I. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.